Just before we start, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Friday was Armistice Day. Um, many people affected by those who have lost loved ones in the service of their country. Um, we just, from that position of light, hold those people. And there are something like 20 people, a list here, known to us uh, here in this uh, um, chapel who are going to fight in uh, Ukraine. And we just hold them as well um, at this uh, particular time and all those involved in, in that conflict on both sides. Pray for both uh, President Putin and President Zelensky and all those involved. And just remember the, the tragedy of war and all of us who are affected by the loss. Amen. Always good to clear the air. So we are now on uh, number nine of the ten ox heading pictures. And I know some of you are coming to the first time. So this is, uh, I just always want to give you a previously on ten ox heading pictures. And the ten ox heading pictures really are, they're a sort of Zen tool that uh, were designed a thousand years ago in order to uh, to, 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 to start state the stages of awakening in, uh, in the spiritual life. Um, there's a sort of, you know, they were written a thousand years ago. They're, they're really t to show how the, the nature of, uh, of our spirituality, how it develops when people go on that spiritual path. And whatever spiritual path they go on, this is not, you know, we're looking, not really interested in Zen here. We're interested in, in the actual spiritual part itself, whether it comes from a Christian perspective or a Buddhist perspective, whatever perspective. Because the truth of the matter is it doesn't come from a Christian perspective or a Zen perspective. It comes from a you perspective. There is the Andy path. You know, there is the Ward path. There is the Curtis path. And each of us have our own paths that we're going along. And we just get help from wherever we can. So, 10 Oxoding pictures. You might want to follow me through as I go through the episodes. Uh, so, episode one, episode one of this. Uh, I've watched too much TV Episode one, searching for the ox. Now that stage is where we're in our lives and we're crashing along and we're doing our business. We're trying to get our, our career started. We're doing whatever we can. But there's a nagging feeling in there that it's not all, that's not all there is. It's not all about getting that relationship or getting that job or getting the money or whatever it is. You get that nagging feeling and you don't know quite what it is. And you think, is there a meaning in life? The ox in this represents the divine nature, or God, or the meaning of life. And so you start on that search, which is like, you know, maybe, maybe it's worth going to, you know, looking at a couple of Deepak things on, on the internet, or maybe I'll listen to Oprah, or whatever it is. You know, you, you go on that, that journey, and then you think, well, I, I, maybe I'll do a start, a little meditation or something. And that moves us on to the second stage, which is seeing the traces. And you do your little meditation or anything, and you start thinking, hey, this makes sense. You know, the, I, I can, you know, you, I heard Oprah talk about it and Deepak and all these people. And so you think, yeah, well, that does make sense. I just said so there might be some. So, and you start to gradually see that the possibility that there might be a bit of more meaning in life. And, and you, you see the traces. And then suddenly, you, you, you just have an experience, maybe out on the mountain, Number three, seeing the ox. You might be up on the mountain, you might be at home, you know, resting, or whatever it is, or you, whatever it is, you, and suddenly you catch a glimpse of that nature of spirituality. You get a glimpse of that experience of that oneness in the world, that, you know, you have your own little, you know, transfiguration experience. Whatever it is, you get a glimpse of it, and you think, wow, this is worth pursuing. And so you begin to pursue, you see the ox, you begin to pursue, and then catching the ox, once you've started on that spiritual journey, it's always a bit of a struggle. Because you've got all the people saying, you know, why do you want to go to the chapel? I mean, honestly, you know, what do you, want to, you, you, you should be watching the Broncos at 11 o'clock today, not going to the chapel. And you get all this, I know you will be, all of you off. But the fact of the matter is you get pulled hither and yon because you're, you're saying, I want to go on this path. But all your friends are saying, or, or, all the things, why bother, you know? 
you know, have another drink, relax. It's an only, and you get that sort of pulling between the way that your life was and the way that the possibility of happening. And you, you're grabbing onto it like that. And then finally, once you've, you know, you do your meditation, you do your stuff, and you suddenly start to feel you're in the zone. And things start to happen, and you just feel that that meaning is catching up on you. You feel that you're in the right place at the right time. Things start to conspire, and you start to feel, you know, you're, you and the, the ox, you're herding the ox. And then coming back on the ox's home, suddenly you feel, you know, this is great. I'm really enjoying this. I'm enjoying my, my life. I, I've stopped drinking. I don't smoke as much dope. I, I've done all these things and I'm going down this path. And you just feel a sense of, in, in, in Galatians, I love that passage which says there is no, in the spirit you are not under law. You, there's a freedom in that whole experience and expression that you've got and, and you're, you're free in your own nature. Then you've got number seven, the ox forgotten, leaving the man alone. And that's the whole experience where, you know, you realize that, you know, you've met with that divine nature, that actually you've done all the struggling, you've, 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 you don't need to go through all the sort of bits and bobs of the whole spiritual practice. The ox is a metaphor. You're relaxed, you're, you're in your zone, you're at home, you don't feel the need to go out and chase after getting enlightened or anything like that. You're, you're, you're in your trousers, as we say in England. Do you have that expression here? In England we say, you're in your trousers. That's a good expression. You get the sense of being in your trousers. And this guy is definitely in his trousers there. And so that's really, in a sense, the end point of the description, getting in your trousers, is the end point of it. And the next three are really a description of the experience of what it's like to be in your trousers, what it's like to have that experience and, and, and to be at one with your divine nature. And the first one is, that, you know, how does, it, how does it actually feel? What's the, the, the feeling? And there's that, uh, the ox and the man are gone out of sight. And I said last week that that circle that's there is the circle of our field of vision. It is the idea that actually we carry that. You know those dogs when they, when they, 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 they scratch themselves? They have that cone. You're almost carrying this field of vision around with you. And the whole idea is that you don't, you don't associate with, with your, your, your mind and yourself and your body. You don't associate with, with everything that's out there. There is that awareness that you are the container and the contained. Uh, that's the experience of it. It's the awareness of being the container and the contained. And this week, what we're looking at is returning to the origin, back to the source. So that's, you're all up to date. You haven't found out who done it yet, but you know, you know what's going on. And, uh, and this is where we are right now. So returning to the origin, back to the source. And, and each one, as you see, has got a little poem. So I'm going to read the little poem first. It'll, it just help. From the very beginning, pure and immaculate, the man has never been affected by defilement. He watches the growth of things while himself abiding in immovable serenity of non-assertion. He does not identify himself with maya-like, that means illusion or dream-like, he does not identify himself with dreamlike transformations that are going on around him, nor has he any use of himself, which is artificiality. The waters are blue, the mountains are green, sitting alone, he observes things undergoing changes. Sitting alone, he observes things undergoing changes. To return to the origin, to be back at the source, already a full step this. Far better it is to stay at home, blind and deaf, and without much ado. Sitting in the hut, he takes no cognizance of things outside. Behold, the streams flowing, whither nobody knows, and the flowers vividly red, for whom are they? So, you can see from the picture there, it's about nature, it's about the earth, 
It is about the source of all. We came from the earth. All of us came from the earth. You know, we are the universe made conscious of itself. We are stardust, all that stuff. But we came from the earth. Originally, we were just earth atoms. From an evolutionary perspective and from a life perspective as well, in that it feeds us and from it we derive all good. One of the things that this mandala represents is that field of our vision. It's again the perfect circle. And you can see on there, it's almost like the circle that is on here with the, uh, the trees and nature. And the mandala does represent the return to the origin. It is that representation of it. It is the movement, it is the creative nature of things, of, of the orb. And the imagery of the mandana represents the imagery, imagery of the world. And we're going to do a little exercise now with the mandala, if it's okay with you. We're going to do a gazing exercise. Now, who's done a gazing exercise before? Good. I tell you what a gazing exercise is. A gazing exercise is where you gaze at the mandala. And you're you know, when you look around, you know, when I look at Nicole, I press myself back into focus. I look at who she is. Then I look at Catherine. I, I go into focus. When you're gazing, you let it go out of focus. And you can't not blink, but you, you try and blink as little as possible. But when you blink, all right, I'm going to set it all up. When you blink, you don't blink it back into focus. You let it swim. You let it go its way, the way that it wants to go. And, you know, have a go now, just for a few seconds. Have a go and let it swim in your mind. What you do is let go of your mind trying to make out the cloth and let that cloth make itself in your mind. Don't press it into focus, but just gaze at it. Try not to blink, but you know, don't make a thing of that either. And just you know, see how the cloth moves for you. What sort of shapes it takes up. How solid it becomes like an orb. Okay, so that was a practice. So <laughs> that was just a practice. So I'm going to move this now. We're going to get serious. And... Uh, I'm going to move this as well. And we're going to do this for five minutes. And what I want you to do is just do all those things, just let it go. And what I'm going to undo, I'm going to, I'm going to um, bang the gong. By the way, any questions? Do you get a sense of it? Do you get a sense of what I ask you to do? So let it go and just see what happens. I'm going to bang the gong. And we're going to do five minutes like this. Just let it go. Let it swim in front of you. Let it do what it wants. Just gazing.
Okay. So um, I'm just going to ask, you know, what did you notice? Did anybody notice? What did you notice when you were doing that? Just put your hand up, just whatever you noticed. Yes, Siam. It changed. How, how did it change, Siam? The different points on yeah. it yeah. were, were um, accented while others faded away. Right. Fantastic. Thank you. Anybody else? What, anybody else notice? Yes. Drew. Yeah. It became three-dimensional. Yes. Like a ball or an orb. Like a ball or an orb. Great. Anybody else? Yes. I felt like it was breathing. I was like, what is that cloth? I felt like there's movement. It was breathing. Thank you. Yes. What else? Bill. So uh, you mentioned it, the Mandela is a perfect circle. Yeah. And as I, I guess that maybe represents the, the height of enlightenment. But when I looked at it, I noticed the shadow wasn't a perfect circle. And it just was kind of comforting. There's maybe room for us, those of us who aren't fully in our trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. good. No, one other question. What did you notice your mind doing while you, because, you know, you're doing this, you're, I must say, I've got to gaze, I've got to gaze, I've really got to, I've got to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm blinking, but I'm not going to pay. What did you notice your mind doing while that was going on? It, it was constantly searching for different patterns and yeah. trying, but it was very focused. So at the end, I realized I really was in the present for five minutes. Yes. There was no other real thoughts except sort of the shapes and making sense of it. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, Randy. Uh, I was I couldn't really focus on it too well till I started paying attention to the shadow. Yeah. Then it became three dimensional and it seemed like the thing was moving forward and it looked like more of a face coming. It looked like a face coming. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Anybody else what your mind did with it? Anybody else? Yes, Donna. The um looking at the two I almost saw them as the wave figures, the green and a red. And the the green spiraled down and the red Spiraled up. The green spiral, very interesting. Yeah. The green and the red spiral felt like it was going down, and the other one felt like it was coming. Fantastic. Up. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That's very, that's absolutely excellent. And thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate it. Um, your mind, in whatever circumstances, is continually trying to make sense of what it's seeing in front of it. Not just that, but all around, the mind is continually trying to make sense of what it sees in front of it. That is what happens in life. I said this the other week, but it's important. Your relationship with your mind is the most important relationship in your life. Your relationship with your mind is your most important relationship with your mind. It dictates each of the states that are contained in the 10 oxidating pictures. Each of these states is dictated by your relationship with your mind. There's a lovely passage from um, the Hua Hu Ching, which is also written by Lao Tzu, who wrote the Tao Te Ching. And Lao Tzu says in this book, he says, Thus... The more one knows and understands, the more dimness and confusion are created. The more one knows and understands, the more dimness and confusion are created. One is con continually bewildered by what one knows and sees. One is bewildered by what one knows and sees. If by chance one manages to avoid falling into the pitfall of the content of what one knows and sees, if you can avoid falling into the pitfall of the content, one invariably becomes trapped in the mechanics of how one knows and sees. If it's not the content, it's like, what am I doing? I'm, you, know, you get trapped in the mechanics. If one is not confused by the appearance of what one sees, then one can be fooled by what enables one to see. The mind clings to the images it creates. Notice that when you're doing that. Whatever the image is, the mind clings to the images it creates. All of this conditioning builds up layer upon layer of conceptual filters through which one looks at the world. Thus, not only is one's perception of the world distorted by the interposition of these false images, 
but one's very being becomes distorted. You know, the very fact we're looking through these filters at the world, you know, not only is it distort, as, as you saw it just distorting there, not only is it distort that, but we become distorted by, by what we see. The mind is continually judging, as Diane said last week. She said, I cannot stop making judgments. And this stage is describing the death of those judgments. It's often said that the enlightened master just eats when he's hungry, hungry and takes a nap when he's sleepy. He eats when he's, she eats when she's hungry and she takes a nap when she's sleepy. But we ask, should I eat now? What should I eat? Am I on a diet? Shouldn't I wait for lunch? And as for the nap, is it right to sleep in the middle of the day? Won't that ruin my sleep? Yummy, 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 yummy. We're continually thinking about judging, judging, judging. What's good, what's bad. This stage recognizes that the state is the, it's the state of just seeing with no judgment. We experience ourselves as part of the source, connected to it, dependent on it, but not judging it. Connected to it, dependent on it, but not judging it. Thich Nhat Hanh says, contemplation on interdependence, and this is what we're talking about, interdependence. Contemplation on interdependence is a deep looking into all phenomena in order to pierce through to their real nature. If you look without judgments, you pierce through to their real nature in order to see them as part of the great body of reality. And in order to see that great body of reality is indivisible, it is one. We cannot be cut into pieces that exist separately from each other. And in this stage, we give ourselves completely to the source with no judgment. When you were gazing, you were giving yourself completely to the source with no judgment. Now, this is obviously difficult as we go about our day-to-day -day life. As Diane says, we're always judging. But what we have to remember is, is that this is Diane Light. <laughs> this is the world Diane Godfrey thinks, what's that me? <laughs> no, it was Diane Light last week, not Diane Godfrey, sorry. We have to remember that this is a process of spiritual, it's a process of spirituality that we're talking about. That, that great definition of spirituality from Rowan Williams. Dif spirituality, spirituality is the cultivation of a sensitive and rewarding relationship with eternal truth and love. Spirituality is the cultivation, active thing, of a sensitive, it's not abusive, and rewarding, it enriches us, relationship, that key word, with eternal truth and love. And that's a sermon in itself. And the question we ask ourselves, have to ask ourselves, is how much do we want that? How much do we want that spirituality? Do we want it? once a week when we turn up here or we, when we watch online? Do we want it once a day if we have a meditation practice? Do we want to have it once a day? Or do we want it more than that? And if we want it more than that, then that cultivation of a sensitive and rewarding relationship, it has to happen more than once a day. It has to be an ongoing thing. And that means bringing this whole approach to life into our day-to-day -day living. And that's really what, what this is. It's about bringing this whole approach. And it's your choice of how much you want to do it. You know, you can't be sort of, you know, working an electronic machine and thinking, I'm just going to let myself gaze at the machine. Because very quickly it will drill through your hand and you'll be very focused on your hand for a while. <laughs> but, you, you know, obviously that's the case. But it does mean bringing the approach. Thich Nhat Hanh says, if we only study emptiness as a philosophy, it'll not be the door of liberation. That's what we're doing here, really, studying emptiness as a philosophy. It, it is not the door of liberation. It has to become a way of life. 
And so we bring our meditation into our day-to-day -day life. When we find ourselves judging, this is how you do it. When you find yourself judging, we go back to our breath. Take that hands very big there. Back to your breath. And suddenly you're out of your mind, you're, out, you're, you're back in your body. And you become aware of that outer circle that we aspire to live from. You go back to your breath and you become aware of that field of vision, that outer circle. And we continue to do that until that becomes a way of life. We just continue to go back to our breath until it becomes a way of life. We find ourselves coming back to our breath and that circle naturally as we go about our day. And so we live a lot of the time in a non-judgmental way where rocks are hard and water's wet. You know, to me, when people ask, you know, what does enlightenment mean? That's, that's always the best answer. Rocks are hard and water's wet. When you're hungry, you eat. When you're tired, you take a nap. Because that really is the nature of enlightenment. It's not some special state or experience that we inhabit. It is inhabit it's inhabiting the ordinary and having it be extraordinary. It's inhabiting the ordinary and having it be extraordinary. We know that when we walk in the mountains, when we see our children at play, when we lose ourselves in anything for a moment, because this is losing ourselves in life. It's allowing ourselves to be lost, but realizing that in that lostness, we have found our true home of the present moment. Our true home is the present moment. We find ourselves in our true home. You know, in this 10 oxygen pictures, we began by searching for something. We put all our energy into trying to finding it. We see it. We lay hold of it. We tame it. Only to find... Now, it's nothing all the time that our glasses were all, we were looking for our, searching for our glasses, and there they were always on our nose. That what we see is what we get. That's the end point we come to. If you go back to the poem that's on the, on the little, little brochure you've got there. From the beginning... From the very beginning, the pure and immaculate, the man has never been affected by defilement. It has always been thus. Our mind might tell us otherwise, but it has always been thus. As the Zen master says, a good, nice little Zen master statement, the appreciation of objects and subjects is the same for an enlightened person and an unenlightened person. The appreciation of subjects and objects is the same for an enlightened person and an unenlightened person. It's all the same, whoever you are. But the one who's traveled this path knows the extraordinariness of the ordinary. Now, Cyprian Consiglio is the abbot of the Big Sur uh, monastery. They're very like the Trappist monastery that at Snowmass. He's coming here next May uh, to do a day with us. And he says, and he's talking about this, this thing of you know, being in the, in the source of things. He says, we have to just rediscover our roots in the earth. And along with that, a recovery of the feminine in our bodies, in, getting into our breath. We come at this rediscovery with our self-reflexive con consciousness intact, with our ability to self-reflect. We come to this discovery with our ability to self-reflect intact and with our analytical and critical inter intellect. We don't lose, we don't think, there's nothing, we don't lose our critical, critical intellect or our an analytical mind, but we integrate what has been lost to them, which is, the non-judgmentalism in, in the present moment. We integrate what has been lost. We integrate our analytical and critical intellect into the earth and into our bodies. Then he says, as the American philosopher J. Needham writes, this revolutionary way of understanding creation requires that we seek to inhabit the physical 
with more, not less, of our psyche. We have to inhabit this realm. As we evolve, we don't merely transcend. We don't transcend into some other state. We include the higher states and stages contain all that has come before. We still need to overcome our dualism, our thinking that the earth is something separate from us. We have to overcome this from our real selves. And so we can be absorbed into what we have previously subjugated. It too, the earth and all that, is a manifestation of the divine ground of God. And remember Sam Maxim's statement, his warning, how we are in our bodies is how we will be in the earth. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. How we relate to our bodies is how we relate to the earth. He emphasizes humanity's relationship to the earth mirrors our own essential relationship to our physical body. And so, as we are to our bodies, we are to the earth. And then in that poem, he watches the growth of things while himself abiding in the immovable serenity of non-assertion. He doesn't identify himself with male-like, dream-like transformations of the things that are going on around him. Waters are blue, mountains green. He's sitting alone, observing things undergoing changes. He is aware but not pulled in by his thoughts and his judgments. That's where he is. And then the rest of the poem. To return to the origin, to be back at the source. Then he says, already a full step. Far better to stay at home, blind and deaf, without much ado, sitting in the hut, taking no cognizance of things outside. Behold, the streams are flowing, where nobody knows, and the flowers are visibly red, but, but who cares? So this is pretty radical here. He says... He said, it's better to be blind and deaf so that nothing can interfere with the process. Why even bother with this, going back to the source? This whole process, he says, has been a waste of time. Because there's always been nothing to look for and nothing to find. Now, this is that extreme perspective which says not to be sucked in either by what's going on or by what we think of, of is going on. He's, he's, Getting sucked in is the worst thing that can happen. So you might as well be blind and deaf and not worry about all of it. There is only the what isness of life. And that's what true enlightenment is. Not some great experience or some advanced way of seeing things, but a radical acceptance of what life brings out there, what life brings out there, what life brings in our bodies, and what life brings in our mind. There's a, it's a radical acceptance with no judgment. And that acceptance is what we're cultivating in this sensitive and rewarding relationship uh, with, with um, uh, eternal truth and love. And we're not throwing the, body out with the, uh, the, the baby out with the bathwater with this. What we're really saying is that if you want to really look at the extreme thing of not being involved, it would be that you just shut yourself away. But what he's saying is that don't be concerned with the judgment. Zen Master Moomin says, after Sartori is the same as before Sartori. After enlightenment is the same as before enlightenment. After enlightenment, you are the same as you were before enlightenment. Just as you are is fine. You are saved just as you are. The very place, this very place, is the lotus land of purity. This very body is the body of the Buddha. So, you know, when you hear all this, you, you, I can hear you say, you know, what's the point of it all? You know, given all of this, what's the point? Well, the point is that you have struggled to get to the no struggle. You have struggled to get to the no struggle. And only after the struggle can you realize that there is no struggle. Only when you struggle with this can you realize that there is nothing to struggle with. And if you're still struggling, then you've not yet got to the point of no struggle. If you're still struggling, then you've not yet got to the point of no struggle. The very fact that we struggle tells us that we've got further to go. Because it's only in the no struggle that we realize that where we've got to is where we were all the time. 
It's only in the no struggle that we realize where we've got to is where we were all the time. This is the peace that passes all understanding. This is what Jesus talks about. This is the peace that passes all understanding. And listen, in my humble opinion, the end point of this journey is peace. We did, and Thursday sat saying last week, we did it on happiness. And actually, I, I don't think happiness is the end point of this. I think it is fundamental peace. It is peace in all circumstances, good or bad, whatever the emotion, whatever the pain or the pleasure, it is the peace underneath all that. So the question really that I have for you is, are you ready to give up the struggle? That's the question. Are you ready for peace? You know, most of us, in theory we are, but actually not in reality. We see the philosophy, but as I said, Thich Nhat Hanh says, if we only study the philosophy, it's not the door to liberation. It has to be lived. And that poses an existential question. Could you give up wanting to change? I think that's the existential question at the bottom of this. After all the work that you've done, and all the work, everything that you can do, after everything that you know you ought to have done, and you've travelled through these nine stages and seen that before Sartori is the same as after Sartori, now could you give up wanting to change? To have your judgments, but not judge them. To have your judgments, but not judge the fact you've got your judgments. To have your thoughts, but, but not be judged or swayed by your thoughts. To feel sad, to feel joy. And for one to be sad and for one to be joyful. And neither good nor bad. Could you see the world going to hell in a handcart and, and, and be okay with that? Be at peace with that? And just do what you do, knowing that's all you can do. You know, that's what you do. You do what you do, knowing that's all you can do. That is the peace that passes understand, all understanding. And if you find it difficult giving up wanting to change, if you find it, give, you know, giving up, give yourself a list, little distance. It's a lovely little mantra that you can use. If, if you find it difficult, you know, when you say, could you give up wanting to change, the you know, truthful answer is no. I'm going to carry on with my struggle because that's all I can do. Then you ask yourself, in theory, could I give up wanting to change? Now, you can answer yes to that. We can all. In theory, could I give up wanting to change? And if the answer is yes to that, then you say, now, would I give up wanting to change? That is the key thing. It's, it's the giving up. It's a great mantra when you want to change the way things are. Could you give up? And for me, that mantra is the gateway to peace. It is the acceptance, the radical acceptance of the okayness of whatever is going on and our willingness to, to accept that. That's what this is about. It's about not judging, but being okay with, with whatever comes our way. I think that's it from me.